our third week of something I'm calling Rediscovering Joy as we look in to Paul's letter to the Philippian church, which is actually a letter that Paul wrote from prison, and we talked about that a couple weeks ago. Now, here's the thing. I, I kind of wanted to go through this at the beginning of the year because I believe we're in anxious and fearful times, and I feel like we've been that way, at least as a country. Um, I don't know. It seems like forever now, but especially the last three years or so. In this this letter to the Philippians, I really enjoyed, especially in seminary, because it was only four chapters long. It was easy to kind of get into, just confessing. Um, it, you know, I was asked to write a paper about a particular book in the Bible, and you know, as a seminary student, you know what I did first? I looked to see which one was the shortest. Uh, this was one of them. But it's four chapters long, but in those four chapters, Paul points out or he talks about joy or rejoicing 14 different times. In fact, he commands people, the people of that church, to rejoice. Uh, he commands them to, to do that daily because if they do, then they find deep, lasting joy in life, no matter what the circumstances are. And the irony is that he wrote all of this, this letter of joy, that's what we call it. In some of your Bibles, it might even say the epistle of joy, which is letter. He wrote this knowing full well that he was in prison awaiting his execution. So he knows a little something or two about how to find joy in the midst of difficult times. But just as a reminder, as we get deeper, uh, if you're in person or online, I always pr try to provide a study guide or a devotional that goes along with it. And so if you're in person, you can get one of these uh, right outside on the lobby. There's a table over there. If you're an online person, you can do that right from the, the series page. There's a button that uh, says to get the study guides. And I do this because I don't just want you to take my word for it. Somebody reminded me this morning that I've been saying that for a long time. Um, and the reason why is because I learned long, long ago uh, some very important words in life. And maybe you can repeat these words after me. I could be wrong. Could, could anybody say that? I could be wrong. What, what I do in my best is to engage the stories in the Bible and the text and, and do what I can to convey those stories as best that I can, knowing that I could be wrong, knowing that 10 years from now, I may very well look at the manuscript for what I wrote and think to myself, oh, bless your heart, Ben. So I want you to engage with the scriptures on your own, to, to do that on your own or with other people. But to get us going into today's uh, message, I, I want to begin this way, because um, when I was a kid, I, I heard a bunch of different stories growing up. In fact, in school, one of the most important parts of the day when kids would actually be quiet is whenever it's like, hey, it's story time, right? And so we are a, a people of story, and growing up, there was a group of books called the Golden Book Collection, and one of those books that I thought was funny was the book Henny Penny. Anybody hear of the, the story of Henny Penny? I have a copy of it here. Um, this is an ancient story. Actually, its origins or forms of this story date back over 2,000 years to different cultures. In China and Europe, there's different forms of this story. It has been told and retold in, in different ways. And, and essentially, the story begins like this. Henny Penny one day is out in the barnyard scratching in the barnyard, and an acorn falls and hits dear P Henny Penny on the head, which freaks her out, and she starts to scream. If you know what she screams, say it with me. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. That's what Henny Penny did. I, I think she had a different voice than I have, but she really thinks the sky is falling, and she knows to herself, I need to rush and tell the king that the sky is falling. And on her way there, she meets other friends, right? I always laughed at the names. So she runs into her friend, Cocky Locky, and says, Cocky Locky, the sky is falling. And her friend freaks out with her. The sky is falling. I'm going to go tell the king. And so Cocky Locky says, can I come with you? And she's like, yes. And they, they go off to tell the king. And then they run into another friend, Ducky Lucky. Ducky Lucky follows suits. Can I go with you? Yes, we can. And then after a while, they, they come against Goosey Lucy, um, which is like a play on Lucy Goosey, right? But Goosey Lucy, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And soon enough, there is mass hysteria, and they're all on their way to tell the king that the sky is falling. And growing up, it never occurred to me, um, what are they going to do about it, Right? Even if they make it to the king, the sky is falling. What do you do with that? 
it's a story about fear and how it plays into the minds of others and can create a hysteria. I always love kids' stories. Sometimes they tell the, the greatest things. And, and, and it, it's still important today because the human nature is to actually buy into fear. And to create fear. And, and, and fear has a way to prey on us and to change us in ways that steal our joy. Remember, we're talking about rediscovering joy in here. Today is about how to do it in fear and worry. So let's begin by talking about some fears. Uh, there's a, a group called the Chapman University. It's a college. They have an ongoing study of fear year after year. You can go into their website, you can see different things, and what they do is, is they take surveys to find out in America what are the greatest fears uh, from year after year. And the top 10 fears found in 2022, so last year, suggests that American fear centered around five main topics, the top 10. One would be uh, corrupt government officials, uh, the harm to somebody they loved, war, environmental concerns, and economic concerns. The top 10, they, they were all in there. And one thing that interests me about these fears is, is that they change over time. From year to year, we fear different things. See, of the top 10 American fears we had last year, two of them had to do with air pollution and water pollution and damage to the environment. Just two years ago, five of those fears were actually in the top 10, but now it's just a couple. Two of the top 10 fears for last year were very personal. They were fears about somebody that we love getting sick and dying. Our number seven fear is not having enough money for the future. And in 2019, so just two years ago, that was still one of our fears, but that was number 10. I think in the state of inflation and economic downturn over the last year, that made that fear rise for many Americans. In fact, you can find out all of these different things. I haven't quite found out the top 100 of 2022, but I do have them from the year before, if you'd like to know some. And so before I tell you the, the top fear, I want you to think for yourself an, a, of a number, because I, I want to read to you what um, the fear is for this number. It would be a number between 11 and, let me see, 94. And not 94, by the way, because 94 in America is clowns. Yes, it actually made the list. And you know what made the list above that one? Zombies. 89. So anybody want to share a number with me? I've got it right here. Hold on. 27. A nuclear weapons attack. I heard another one over here. Seven. Oh, well, I think I just said seven. Yeah, seven was not having enough money for the future. Forty-five. 45. And then we'll do one more. A devastating hurricane. I think we're safe here, but we've got friends. In fact, yeah, the winds, they just went through this last year in their, their place in Florida. Whew. One more fear. 38. The collapse of the electrical grid. Yes, how many of you drive electric cars? That would freak you out, yeah. You see, we have different fears. And the number one fear, just so you know, uh, in 2022 in America was actually government corruption. And it, by the way, has been our number one fear for years. I don't know why. Maybe it has something to do with the people we elect. <laughs> but we have a fear of government corruption. Production. Why? Why is this happening? Here are some questions I want to get to, and maybe some practical things today. Why are we getting more worried and more afraid? That's kind of where we're at. See, I believe in part the answer is because fear is a very powerful motivator for human beings. It's our survival instinct. It's what helped us um, evolve into the people that we've become. Because we learned long, long ago, whenever you're out on the plains and you see a very large cat called a lion, we learned not to say here, kitty, kitty. Why? Because we were afraid, and we ran for our lives, and it kept us alive. And, and so some ways, fear is a good thing, but because fear is so hardwired into us, and such a big part of our survival instincts, it, it can also be used to manipulate us, and it is used to manipulate us. 
Those who know this, they're getting better at it. We use fear in all sorts of advertisements. For tires, for instance, we're afraid that, rightfully so, that we're going to have a tire go out in one of the most horrible places. We use it to sell tires. We, I've actually come across fear um, being used to sell deodorant. Um, fear, of course, for life insurance and home security systems. Fear has been used by pastors and churches to, to coerce people to go to church or to come to church or to give to the church, to use their faith in a certain way. Fear has been used as a tool for greed to, to actually make us buy things that we don't want. Fear is used by politicians and news outlets to, to get our support and, and our money to secure their votes for power. Fear is a powerful tool. There's a researcher, her name is... Uh, Dr. Shana Gadarin, and, and she writes about us being afraid. And, and one of the things that she said is no matter what we fear, we begin to actually look, when it's talking about news, for news sources that talk about the things that we're afraid of. Did you know that? We do. When there are things that we're afraid of, we tend to gravitate towards the news that talks about this. And, and I can tell you this is true from my past experience. A year and a half ago, when Tammy and I moved to Kansas City, many of you know we lived in Joplin. Joplin for almost 20 years, and we were there when a tornado came through and took out about a third of the city and killed 161 people. And what happened ever since then is any time there's going to be severe weather, and now we can kind of predict that days ahead, people start to freak out. And what we learned there also is if you have one news report saying that a tornado is likely to hit and one that says, you know, we're just kind of going to have bad weather, you know which one people actually go to follow? The one that says a tornado is likely to hit. We get drawn back, there we did, to the very thing that reinforced our fears over and over again. Because we sought it out. We listened to it. It's similar, I believe, to an addict that goes back to the very thing that they know is killing them. I think it was one of our presidents a long time ago, Roosevelt, who said this. The only thing to fear is, and you might know this, fear itself. Why? Because fear is a killer. It's a killer uh, individually as well as societally. And, and what's so, I think, very different in this time than any other time in human history, and you probably already know this, is we are in a constant, never-ending flow of information from dozens of different directions all at once, all of them leveraging and using fear quite a bit with a message to keep us coming back for more. That's the world we live in. There's a movie or a documentary that came out a couple of years ago called The Social Dilemma, talking about social media. And, and they actually exposed how social media preys on this very tendency in us, feeding us more things that make us afraid, knowing that when we see it, we will click on it. We call that clickbait. And when we click on it, we then see a bunch of ads, and all of a sudden, they make more money because we click on the things that we're afraid of. And, and listen, this process, it sells tons and tons of stuff. Never in human history, I, I, it, it may even get worse, I don't know, but have we had this toxic mix of our natural fears being highly concentrated and, and this fear-based information fed to us in the very palms of our hands, hour after hour after hour? Is it any wonder our fears grow? Is it any wonder that on any given day we feel like the sky is falling? Listen, God did not create us to live in fear. That's what I believe from reading the stories. God does not want us to live in fear. He simply doesn't. And, and so we've got to be able to break this cycle and live differently. And that's what we're going to get into now with some scripture and some practical things. How do we break the fear cycle and the worry cycle? Now, last week I spent some time at Panera in Springfield um, preparing for today, and I started to look up ways online. How do you conquer fear and worry? And I got to tell you, there are hundreds and hundreds of websites, therapeutic ones, um, ones from the medical angle as well as self-help ones, and there's a lot of common answers in our therapeutic world on how to take care of worry and fear, and some of them actually line up with what Paul talks about in this letter. Paul writes this, he says, don't worry about anything. You heard this earlier. 
Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything and tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. It's like, do this and then, he says, then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. And his peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So for Paul, addressing worry and fear first begins with prayer. That's according to him. Now, again, in, in some therapeutic circles, they might not go that way, but people of faith, we kind of take our cues from people like Paul, and he talks about prayer. Pray about everything, everything that worries you. Pray about your worry and fear, and he should know a little thing or two about it, because remember, he's in prison. In fact, before he's in prison, he has times where he's been shipwrecked, persecuted, tortured, nearly stoned to death, ha had a contract out on his life, left for dead, and yet he still writes. And you're worried, afraid, pray about everything. So I'll just pause real quick, you church people, and just ask you, how are you doing with that part, praying? I don't know about you, I mean, I'm a pastor, and yet there are times, I, and I get up, and I get going, and it's like, oh, oh I'm late, oh, the dogs, oh, this, and that. And I have to pause, I have to stop myself to pray. I try to make it a habit to pray five times a day. First thing in the morning I pray, God, thank you. And then I always say, God, save me. Not because I, I worry about my salvation, but it's because God saved me from my, primarily myself <laughs> because I know myself. And I pray when I eat, even if it's just to be thankful. How are you doing? Because listen, if, if you don't pray about the things that you worry about, that you're afraid of, and all you're doing is consuming more fear-oriented information, it's not going to help. Stewing over something is not going to help. It's not a replacement for prayer. News outlets are not a replacement for prayer. Consuming things is not a replacement for prayer. So we pray. And I love the way Paul kind of talks about prayer because he tells us that, that an important part of our prayers is being thankful or thanksgiving. You know, we, we all know that thanksgiving is not just a day in November, but it's a lifestyle. And it's encouraged us to, to be thankful for all these things. And listen, don't miss this part because I believe there's power in this if you're thankful. Because I learned from a pastor a long time ago. Um, he said this to me. He says, Ben, you can't be worried and grateful at the same time. Now, I don't know if that's 100% true, but I understand where he was going. It is very difficult to constantly be worried if you're also trying to be grateful and thankful at the same time. Eventually, one of them wins out. You can't be afraid and grateful at the same time. I, I think that he was somewhat right. And, and what Paul is saying, in the face of worry, start with prayer. And in particular, be grateful. He has a heavy emphasis on gratitude, actually, throughout his letters. And he says that when you do that, it actually leads you somewhere. That's the then part of this, the passage. He says, then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. You're worried. You're scared. You're freaked out. Pray. Be thankful. And then what can happen? You experience peace, joy. You rediscover joy in your life. In fact, it's a peace that, depending on your translation, I'll just put it in 21st century, it's a peace that is mind-blowing. It is a peace that's like, holy wow, where did that come from? It's a peace that exceeds anything we understand. And I believe that God is ready to give this to us, but I also believe we have to stop stewing and stop consuming and start praying and praying with thanks and gratitude. But Paul doesn't start there. He also talks about defeating worry and fear. He says, if you want to experience peace, then here's another way to do it. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, this is just a little bit further, whatever is true and whatever is noble, whatever is right and whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy. I always love that line in the Bible because I'm a 90s kid, an 80s kid. Anybody remember Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Every time I read this, it's like, be excellent to one another. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things, he says. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I mean, here's one thing that, where Paul, what he says actually lines up with what modern therapeutic methods talk about, doctors and even self-help. 
They say one of the common ways to overcome anxiety and fear is to address the fear, to take notice first of the things that you're afraid of, whatever makes you anxious, whatever makes you worry. Start to ask yourself things like this, what am I afraid of? Or is this thing really a threat or is it just something that I've imagined that could happen? What I've learned about myself is most stuff I'm afraid of is stuff of the future that most likely won't happen. But since I recognize patterns, I'm able to project past things into the future and, and be afraid of them. For Paul, he, 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 I think the way he would say it, this, again, I, it's always dangerous to put words into the mouth of somebody in the Bible. But I kind of think he, he would be witty and he would say, you know what, it's a good thing to think about what you think about. It's common sense. You ever think about what you think about? I mean, here's what I mean. If you expose yourself to the things that produce fear and worry, you're going to get caught up in this cycle of it, right? If that's all you expose yourself to, you will not know peace. That's why Paul says to think of these other things. Listen, if instead we start to think about things that are excellent and praiseworthy and noble and lovely, and we think about that, then we experience joy. The alternative is we continue to think about the things that nurture hate and division and fear, and when we do that, we will not know peace. We will not understand God's presence. We will not rediscover joy. So think about what you think about. Say, say that with me. Come on now. Think about what you think about. That's one of the most practical ways to overcome fear in, in this cycle that, that comes from time and time again. But there's another, again, I'm giving you some practical stuff today. One is this. If you can sit here and tell me that, that I have a fear, and it's something that constantly consumes your mind. In fact, if there is something that consumes your mind all the time that's a worry, this might be the problem. Maybe it's time to turn off the things that produce fear and worry. And specifically, I, you know, I'm talking about people who have these top 10 fears around politics and war and all of these different things. If you struggle with that, then, then maybe budget or restrict the amount of time that you actually devote to, to getting information about that. I have found that within 20 minutes, I can get caught up on everything that's going on, and I don't have to leave a news channel on 24-7 because what happens in news channels, regardless of, I'm just going to call them theological bents, they repeat the same story hour after hour, and your fear gets nurtured hour after hour. So limit that, budget that, and do something else. Well, what do I do? I don't know, a hobby. Read. And listen, don't read a book that feeds into your fears. One of my practices is reading novels, things that that have nothing to do with my work or the things that I'm afraid of. Get outside, listen to music, do something, find a friend, cook, bake something, and then bring it to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got distracted. Just don't feed your, your, feed your mind fear and worry all the time. That's what Paul is trying to get us to. And, and then Jesus actually talks about fear as well. And you may know this verse. Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? But seek first God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and then these things will be given to you as well. So for followers of Jesus for centuries, we have seen this idea of, of fear actually being a faith issue. It, in you know, sometimes pastors will use that as fear to actually condemn you that somehow you don't have the right faith. But, but it's not about that. You see, it's a faith issue because as we grow in our faith, we learn to start to trust God a little bit more in all things. And the more we learn to trust God in all things, the less fear we have in other things. And so it's a faith issue because the more we buy into fear and worry, the less chance we have or the less capacity we have to trust in God. And we know that from the story of Jesus. Right before Jesus was crucified, he knew that his disciples would be worried and afraid. He was telling them what was going to happen, um, that he would be betrayed, that he would be killed and tortured, that he would come back from the dead. And, and even though he said he would come back from the dead, you know what the disciples did, his best friends? They freaked out. They worried. And so when he says things like, listen, don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid, he was hoping they would get it and we would get it. And then he was crucified, and it was game over. 
And, and all of his friends, all of his disciples, except for one, man, they scattered like cockroaches when the light comes on. They were just gone. Why? Because they were worried and they were afraid because they knew that when the leader dies, they come after the followers. They were afraid. And then Jesus came back from the dead and suddenly in a moment, these, these followers who were terrified for their own lives all of a sudden became so brave that they would actually live perilous lives to the point of death because of it. Why? Because, I believe it's this, when, when somebody that you know and love predicts their own death and their resurrection and they pull it off and they did exactly what they said they were going to do, then you listen to that person and you follow that person. And that person said, don't worry. Don't worry. Do not be afraid. The disciples and the early followers of Jesus, man, they met with him after his resurrection. They touched him. They ate with the resurrected Savior. And suddenly this whole idea about trusting God in the midst of the most fearful things in life made perfect sense to them. And they were able to embrace a lifestyle of do not worry and do not be afraid. Which means we really are left as followers of Jesus with two options. We choose to trust, even though we don't quite understand. Or we choose to worry and to be afraid. Trust leads to joy, leads to peace. Even if we don't fully get it, it still leads to that. Worry and fear, time and time again, leads to death and division and destruction. Now, now here's a way to apply this, to, to break this. And, and it's just a personal practice that I developed a long time ago, which is this. Look for a way to participate in what God is doing today. When you're afraid, when you're nervous, when something's going on that's got you terrified, take a moment and stop and, what, think about what you're thinking about, but then also participate in what God is doing. Jesus taught us that worry should actually, it, that fear is a trigger. It, it, we talk about triggering things. It actually should be a trigger to put us into action, to try to do something different, to get outside of ourselves and our own concerns. So listen, this week, uh, imagine some of you will, when you experience this huge amount of worry and fear, maybe that's the time to trigger you to stop and, and to write somebody a note. Maybe you don't, can't think of anybody, but it's like you just stop. Okay, God, who I need to think of? Oh, okay. Write them a note. Send them a text. Give them a call. When you're overwhelmed with worry, find a way to serve other people. And we know this. We talk to people who s suffer from severe depression, and we tell them one of the keys to living outside of that depression is to what? Serve other people, to focus on others. This is one of the ways Jesus tells us to overcome our worry and our fear. And then at the very end, Jesus tells his disciples who are worried and afraid, he says this. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is not the type that the world gives. So don't be troubled and do not be afraid. Now, why is this important? It, it takes me back to Henny Penny. If you're familiar with the story, you know how it ends. Henny Penny and Ducky Lucky and Cocky Locky and Goosey Lucy, they're all afraid. They're all freaking out. They're, they're going to run to the king and say the, the sky is falling. And along the way, they come across Foxy Woxy. Yeah, Foxy Lady. Sorry, that's a Jimi Hendrix song. Foxy Woxy. They come across and they tell him what's going on. And, and he's like, the sky is falling. Can I go with you? And they're like, yes, let's go tell the king. And he says, well, let's go tell the king, but I know a shortcut. And they follow him. They follow him into a tunnel, which is his den. And at the end of the story, we know that Foxy Woxy and his family and his children enjoyed a great feast. Yeah. It led them to their destruction. If we let fear overcome us, Something or someone, I believe, can use that and lure us away and destroy us. We'll be lured into destroying one another or letting somebody take us. Make no mistake. Living in fear, constantly being in fear is a killer. That's why in your scriptures it tells you over 400 different times, different ways. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't lose heart. They tell us to be shrewd and careful and wise. They also tell us to be compassionate and gentle and kind and self-sacrificing. Our scriptures are a way to help guide us in very practical ways through this life. 
do not be afraid. Why? Maybe because God knows that a fear-driven life leads us to division and to destruction. Or maybe because God knows that if we buy into fear, then the people who, who use fear as a way to influence will lead us and deceive us into destruction. But I'm with the Old Testament a little bit. There's a psalm, which is a song in there that says it this way. Maybe these are the words you need to hear today. The writer says, God is our refuge and our strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear when earthquakes quakes come and mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble as the water searches. God's voice thunders and the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. God says, be still and know that I am God. God is our refuge and strength. Listen carefully. The sky is not falling. No matter what news outlet you see, no matter what preacher you hear, the sky is not falling. So may you and I not give in to fear. May we not give in to anybody who is a fear dealer in this world and and not be afraid. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.